good afternoon or morning or evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world uh, taking part uh, in this webinar. Uh, thank you so much for spending an hour of your time with us to talk about scaling video delivery. Obviously, a very hot topic uh, in the streaming video space today. This webinar is provided to you by the Streaming Video Alliance. And if you're not familiar with us, we are a global organization uh, that comes together, uh, bringing people and companies from across the ecosystem to solve critical technical challenges in the streaming video space. Our goal is to help uh, companies provide a better than broadcast experience for streaming video at scale uh, with the highest uh, user experience and, and performance as possible. So what we're going to do today, uh, just a few quick housekeeping things, is uh, this webinar is being recorded. So we will have it posted on our website uh, later today, and then you'll, uh, you'll also receive an email that indicates uh, it's available, uh, and then anybody who was unable to attend today will receive that same email. So it's a great thing to share to other people uh, who might be interested in the topic but couldn't attend. All right, so what we're going to start with is we're going to start with some introductions. We've got four great panelists here. Uh, unfortunately, Wayne from CD Networks was unable to join at the last moment, so uh, we miss him. Uh, we're still going to tackle some of his questions, but, um, but we have four really experienced panelists with us uh, representing quite a spectrum of offerings within the, the, the streaming video space um, you know, as technology companies and service providers. So let's start with some introductions, and we'll start off with Guillaume from Broad Peak first. Yes, hi everybody. My name is Guillaume Bichot. Uh, I'm heading uh, an entity in Broadpeak uh, called Exploration. And um, Broadpeak, just for refreshing you, is a CDN uh, solution provider for telecom companies and also content providers. Fantastic. Uh, Thierry from Harmonic. Yes, um, hello everyone, I'm Thierry Fautier. I'm a Vice President of Video Strategy at Harmonic, which covers uh, most of the new and uh, longer term innovations. I'm of course uh, very involved in the OTT delivery. We are a member of Streaming Video Alliance and I would be happy to share with you Harmonic perspective on how to scale uh, video on the OTT. Fantastic, and we've got Brent from Hellastore. Thank you, JT, and thank you for the uh, Streaming Video Alliance for having me on this panel today. My name is Brent Yates. I'm the CTO of Hellastorm. Hellastorm is a company that makes high-performance, specialized servers and hardware to accelerate video streaming at scale. So this is a, a very close topic to our hearts and something that we actually have some strong feelings about. So I look forward to talking to some of these issues. Awesome. And last but definitely not least, we have Mark from Cortex. Hello everyone, thanks Jason for the introduction. So I'm uh, Mark Bayavuan, I'm the CEO of Cortex. Um, we're doing um, a, uh, a cloud native uh, streaming software um, and our focus is to use the cloud to be able to scale live delivery. So uh, that's, uh, that's good to, to talk about that uh, streaming video alliance. Fantastic, and I'm just realizing <laughs> there's a major French contingent on this webinar. What is going on here? <laughs> the French are taking over the world when it comes to streaming. <laughs> um, all right, so let, let's uh, let's jump into some questions. So, obviously, scaling, uh, you know, especially on the delivery aspect, uh, but there are lots of things, lots of components within the streaming video workflow that need to be scaled in order to deliver a, a great video experience at scale. So it's kind of a you know, kind of a funny little connection there. Like, uh, you know, for example, you can't have just one encoder uh, to deal with 10 million, uh, you know, concurrent viewers for a live stream, right? That's not gonna, that's not gonna work. Uh, you have to scale that component of the workflow. So um, this is a really interesting topic. Uh, and, you know, and again, it's something that the Streaming Video Alliance is very, very engaged on, um, especially from the live perspective, which is where, a lot of the emphasis is being placed right now on scalability, but it obviously applies to on-demand uh, as well. So, so let's talk a little bit about a, sort of a high level of you know scaling video delivery. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on Thierry uh, to start with, but you know what do we mean by that? What do we mean by let's scale video delivery? You know, is it just buying more hardware? Is it purchasing more cloud capacity, or you know, adding more encoders? You know, 
can you help us out there, Thierry? Yes. Uh, first, I will start with the Wikipedia scalability uh, definition is the property of a system to handle a growing amount of work by adding resource to the system. So that's the formal definition. In our world, scalability of a unica system is basically number of simultaneous sessions times the bit rate per session. And you know that in OTT, you have adaptive capability, adaptive bit rate capability, so we cover that uh, uh, through our webinar. So now, in terms of the network delivery, you have multiple aspects to look at. You have first the OSS, BSS, the sign-up, sign-in process, and this is where most of the failure come of the first events, big events. You talk about the Formula One, you talk about the European Championship. We, we discovered that a lot of problems come at this very specific stage. Then you have, of course, the encoder, which is the easy part of the system in the sense that it's the static dimensioning. But, of course, if the bit rate is too high, you'll have either uh, some infrastructure capa capacity problem or you are going to reduce the number of users per the equation I mentioned before. Do not forget also the bit rate scales. We, you consider SD, AVC that could become as low as one megabit per second and UHD, HEVC could come around 15 megabits. So it is a huge difference in terms of quality and bandwidth when we consider video. Then you have the origin and the edge cache. Edge cache, we where the scalability start to fail. Uh, fallback could be lower bitrate served by the, the streaming server, which is preferred. Uh, buffering, it's absolutely not preferred, and HTTP 404 errors, the customer basically is gone, is not going to stay on your service. So this is the worst, worst case. And then, of course, the networking aspect, the core network, the access network. If not enough capacity, then the bitrate will have to go lower, you'll go to buffering, and you'll go to 404. So we tend to forget about the network, the access network, and this can be a, a big problem. Now, to answer your question, in terms of infrastructure, what do we look at? OSS, VSS, CDN is obviously more server and more network capacity to stream. Cloud obviously can help to scale all those functionality because if more users, you can instantiate more uh, uh, part of your software in a cloud architecture. For special events like sports, cloud, of course, is the right approach for extra encoding capacity. So this is understood by most of the content providers. Edge, of course, is the CDN caching, and those are boxes you need to put in your network. Uh, public CDN, private CDN is the same, uh, same type of discussion. And of course, for networks, you need more gigabit per second, so more network equipment, more switches, uh, fiber connectivity, DOCSIS connectivity. So you see, depending on where you sit in the network, you'll have to add different resources in order to scale. And when we talk about scale, we should be clear, we talk about millions of simultaneous sessions. The world record, I think, uh, is still uh, with Akama, who could uh, stream more than 20 million uh, simultaneous session for the in, in Indian Premier League is probably going to lead to your next question, uh, JT. <laughs> um, anybody else have anything to add to that? I mean, is this just a mass issue? Well, uh, this is uh, 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 I, I, It is ultimately a math issue, but part of that is changing the formula a little bit in order to get rid of some of the pieces that may no longer be needed and optimize your network. So every single step along that flow is another place where you have to add more servers, another place where you have potential failure points, and another piece to optimize. So if you can simplify your network from the encoding all the way down to the edge device, and we kind of think of it as a direct-to-edge play, if you can do that, then you can makes it easier for you to scale. But ultimately, it still comes down to math. Yeah, Guillaume speaking, uh, I would add... Uh a bit of my definition of it, uh, which is linked to the cost also. So it's about, you know, scaling is about allowing the most of end user media sessions for operating the delivery infrastructure at the lower cost. I mean, one good example is you, you can over dimension your infrastructure, right? And it's really the opposite of a scaling architecture. It would work 
but at a cost that is not sustainable, right? That's the, 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 that's the, the idea. So scalability means that the infrastructure can be sufficiently flexible to digest a variable end user sessions at a reasonable cost. We can scale up, but we have to also to scale down, right? And uh, yeah, uh, part of the solutions, and we are going to talk more about that, it's the, um, there are several solutions to, to, to allow scaling. So part of it is, uh, is cloud. Uh, it's about leveraging cloud technology. So we, we, we will, uh, we will uh, give, a, uh, I think we will talk about that later in the, in the discussion. Yeah, and just and just to add my word, um, so that's Mark speaking from from Cortex. Um, I think that we 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 have to look at the big picture. I mean, uh, as Thierry said, um, it goes from the content acquisition down to to the player, and at every step there are some things to be done to solve the issue. It will not be one single vendor or one single uh, technology that will uh, help um, to solve the whole problem. I mean the 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 gap that we have to close between where we are today in terms of uh, live streaming experience and where we need to be within the next three to four years is really wide. And um, all these steps that uh, were described need to step up. So um, the encoding standards will need to step up, the CDN needs to step up, the network infrastructure needs to level, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's more about looking at the big picture um, than trying to find the magic somewhere. You know, it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, let's talk. I mean, you guys mentioned obviously CDN a bunch of times, uh, and we know that that's a, a component of delivery today, uh, perhaps even more so than it has been in the past. Um, and I had this question, uh, you know, pegged for Wayne uh, from CD Networks, but obviously you know, he's not here. So, Gil, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on you, uh, you know, to start us off with this. But what role do service providers? So not just your own infrastructure, but service providers like Broad Peak or like the CD Networks or Akamai or Limelight, what role do they play in a scaling strategy? Um, and then, you know, on top of that, you know, if you can sort of talk a little bit about some of the best practices for scaling video delivery when employing partners like network providers, uh, you know, like CDNs, is it, you know, is it multi CDN? Is that a best practice? You know, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I can try. Um, um, yeah, CDN is really a key uh, today, you know, uh, uh, for the, you know, because the, um, because the, it asks the, um, the last mile servers, right? So, um, what can I say? Is, uh, yeah, um, a bad caching strategy, a wrong server dimensioning, uh, no overload over strategy. Or yet, you know, uh, a f too few distributed server may, may affect significantly the scaling nature of the service. So, um, uh, what, what kind of good practices for scaling video delivery? Uh, yeah, I think relying on, on, uh, on partners like uh, network providers that can, uh, you know, um, bore you or uh, give you access to, for example, their um, network capacity and, and in particular the multicast is really key, you know. And I will talk about that uh, probably later because the, you know, uh, Brad Pick is kind of specialist in, in, in operating the multicast facilities uh, usually uh, available in, uh, in network providers. So yeah, um, uh, th this is this is really key, you know. The partnering is really key, and and today, uh, network provider that own a multicast facility um, have uh, is not easy for them to open the, this service to uh, to you know content providers that wants to uh, mm -hmm. you know deploy a delivery service or such kind of things. But this is a trend, and it is going to be more and more open. And by the way, in, in standardization like DVB. Uh, we are uh, making everything in a way that it should simplify the, uh, you know, the agreements between network providers and content providers in order for both uh, of them to, uh, uh, to, to uh, mutually uh, operate for the, for the best interest uh, of them. Yeah, um, what can I say? Um, yeah, adapting the infrastructure to the number of sessions to manage for the, 
for the most optimal price uh, yeah we have to the idea is really to look at the best contention ratio you know because uh, again it's, it's again a, 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 my comment is again about this, this notion of price this notion of cost uh, we need to absorb peaks we need to have to have to have really a good a good uh, delivery infrastructure but at a, at a cost that you know that cost that is that is sustainable and this is uh, this is where the optimization has to be uh, is, is very important and we uh, i'll talk later, a little bit later how we can really uh, what are the tools in order to tune you know finally this uh, this um, this delivery infrastructure Sure, and then you know, hey, hey, Brent, can you can you add anything to this? I mean, obviously, Hellstorm, you know, you guys make, um, you know, gear to to accelerate streaming video, and you know, if you think about, you know, could CDNs put your gear in their networks and therefore provide a better service uh, for video delivery, you know, for um, you know, for their CDN customers? Can you maybe just I don't know, kind of any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, that that's exactly the case. For the way we look at it, it's like this. If, if you're a ISP, you can get to your, your customers, but you have to have peering agreements to get to everybody else. The CDNs are the way for the smaller people who aren't ISPs and don't have equipment in there to have that network infrastructure and network bandwidth to get to anywhere in the world. I mean, we, we talk to people who are doing smaller streaming events of 5,000, 10,000 events, up like that. They don't have that infrastructure. So the only way we can get out to the coverage is through CDNs. So they are absolutely critical in this in this flow. The issue that we would like to see from a scaling standpoint is for the CDNs to become more flexible in the types of equipment and services that they allow to run inside their networks. Right now, you have to go through them for everything, and it has to fit a very strict form. We'd like to see more of a cloud-based architecture within the CDN so that we can run services, we can take advantage of hardware acceleration and that kind of thing. So we are working with some smaller CDNs to start up and build those kind of infrastructures because the Internet has changed from 10 years ago to now. The way the infrastructure works, the reliability of it, the scale has changed, but the way we're delivering video has not really adapted to that very well. So we are working with you know some of our partners to streamline that with some new technologies that companies like Streaming Global have to go directly from the encoder to the edge, and that edge is in the CDNs. It's not necessarily at the base of cell towers yet, but it is in the CDN networks, and it's in the ISPs networks. And getting that hardware into those edge locations like that is how you can scale out to tens of millions of people throughout the uh, environment. Sure, sure, okay. Um, you know, this next question is for Mark, and, and it kind of follows along uh, with, the, with the CDN question. Um, obviously, as CDNs become more important, to video delivery and scaling video delivery. I think that um, at the same time, video distributors, um, you know, whether they're a rights holder or a network operator, are looking to new technologies. And, and Cortex is doing some really cool stuff, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of how, how to better deliver uh, video. So Mark, you know, can, can you talk to us a little bit about um, maybe some of the new technologies that, uh, that might help Scale video delivery, whether it's a streaming protocol or an alternative architecture, you know, like peer to peer. Um, you know, can you can you address that a little bit about you know how some of those new technologies can impact or will impact scalability? Yeah, of course, of course. So I I I, I will go I will go on the chain that was described. So um, a bit, I mean, because I think again that we that we have to get a look which is um, very global on that. Um, and I will first start by a, a, um, a simple fact. Um, why is Netflix so strong and why did they manage to, to, um, to deliver um, their series to millions and millions of viewers? Is because basically they control everything. I mean, they, their company is completely focused on, um, on delivering uh, the best experience um, and they control uh, the coders, they control the network, they have business agreements with the network operators, they control the player, etc. So uh, I think one key, if um, you are a content provider and you want to distribute your content in OTT, is really to look at the big picture and try to control 
everything within your network. So going back to uh, your question, yes, um, there are some um, some new um, new architectures, um, new streaming standards uh, that can help scaling. And that's are available today. Um, I'm not saying that the problem is solved, but I'm saying that um, there are things that can be done today in the network and in in, in the standards to 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 have scaling. So you mentioned uh, peer to peer um, integration. Yeah, it can be an answer in some cases. I mean, it's it, it, it's a great answer for some specific cases to relieve the CDM. Um, it has an impact on the access network on the other, on the other side. Um, and there are some situations where there may be some legal issues as well in some parts of the world. So it will not be, I mean, a global answer, but it can help in some situation. Um, on the CDN architecture, um, yes, I guess Guillaume will teach later about uh, multicast ABR. There are some um, new techniques that can, that can help. Um, but again, it cannot be the, the only answer, um, as it may be challenging to implement in some, some network architectures. Um, local caching, of course, um, as Brent said, um, is a great answer, uh, but it may be complex to implement and requires multiple um, agreements between tenants, you know, between the content provider, the network provider. So it can be complex, but it, it's clearly a great, um, a great answer. And um, going further in the, in the, in the chain, um, the encoding can greatly help as well. Um, especially with the cloud, because um, you can reduce, I mean, reducing the bit rates is a simple way to help scaling. I mean, if you, if you, if you, uh, if you get down bit rate by 20, 25%, it's very simple. You can, you can have 25, uh, you can have more, more viewers because basically you, you reduce the bit rate. So um, using new codecs, of course, such as, HVC or, 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 or AV1 can help um, reducing the bitrate by, I would say, 30 to 40%. And my, my, my colleagues here can, can, um, can comment on that. Or you can also use um, more efficient encoding techniques for H.264. Um, and that's where the cloud is key because, I mean, all of a sudden, if the audience is very large, you can allocate more computer sources to your encoder so that it's more efficient. Uh, and by more efficient, then I mean that but for the same um, video quality, you can reduce the bitrate by 20 to 25 percent because you have this ability to scale in a snap to allocate more computer sources to the encoder. So if you combine all these um, improvements, I think that um, you can reach pretty um, impressive levels um, of scaling for your live uh, for your live stream. So there are things that can be done today. Anybody else want to add to that? I mean, Thierry, you want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, for example, content aware encoding? I mean, does that yes. contribute? Yes, I can. Yes, so content aware encoding for those who don't know is the capability of the encoder to modulate the use bitrate depending on the content complexity. So if you recall uh, the ladders, the infamous Apple ladders with constant bit, constant bit rate, people try to walk away from that. iOS 11 uh, gave us some oxygen, letting us to encode variable bit rate uh, as long as we do not cross a cap. And then when you use those techniques, especially for higher resolution HD and UHD, we can safely say that today the deployed commercial services, including Netflix, YouTube, and others, you can reach um, more than 40% bandwidth reduction. And of course, this is without touching the client. Your client will have the capability to basically fetch at a variable pace the content. And this is, as Mark mentioned, a low hanging fruit because you don't change the client. You just need to upgrade your encoder. And at the end of the day, it's a massive saving. Now, in addition to that, of course, you can use more advanced technique like more CPU resource to improve the compression, but with with this approach, you sometime uh, increase the cost of the solution. And I like Guillaume who says uh, we should keep the cost as low as possible. So the question and the challenge for our industry is that can we increase the efficiency without increasing the cost? 
which means no additional CPU resource. And this is where comes new techniques uh, called AI-based compression, where basically you teach your encoder on how to better allocate the bits. Uh, for those who don't know, the classical rate control is a bunch of uh, if then else, which are a lot of heuristics. And we see more and more techniques, um, and Netflix is, of course, uh, making some uh, publicity on this, where you basically learn how to encode, you teach your encoder how to encode without increasing the capacity. And w one caveat here is that Netflix is more uh, VOD, so they run all the possibility and they decide at the end what was the best combination of uh, decision. On the live, we all know we don't have the luxury to put 10 times more resource, so we will have to do it online. And this is where the, the um, savoir-faire, if I may say, is making a difference between sometimes maybe a bit brute force approach where you put a lot of resource versus sometimes something which could be even lower in terms of CPU resource because you can't, you don't have to do a multi pass a three, four. I'm reading people trying to sell three or four passes. This is nice, but you need to connect that to the scalability of the solution you build. So we, we need to be also conscious on the cost, not only on the streaming cost, but also on the uh, compute costs for any encoding. Uh, think of 1,000 channels uh, you have today in the U.S. in an OTT head, and it, it can be very uh, dreadful cost at the end. Yeah, if I can just uh, uh, re redeem that. Um, so I fully agree that, uh, that um, I mean, there are some new AI-based uh, techniques that can quickly help in reducing the bit rate. Um, that being said, what we do without making publicity, what we do is audience-aware encoding. That's how we call that. Um, because basically, we dynamically adapt the compute resources um, of the encoding system to the audience and hence to the CDN cost. So it's a permanent trade-off between the compute cost and the CDN cost. And um, what we do is that we lower the overall TCO of the compute cost and the mental cost altogether. So it, it's, I mean, it's all about making trade-off uh, between the compute cost and the CDN cost, and it can really help um, in reducing the cost and in scaling as well. No, and that's, that's actually a really good segue into the next question, uh, which I'm going to I'm going to ask Brent to uh, to address first. But you know, obviously, if you're trying to scale video delivery and your infrastructure is largely physical so let's say you you know you you have uh, lots of gear in lots of data centers um, scaling can get super expensive i mean i guess you could say stupid expensive um and so you know my question to brent is um as we you know continue to move forward with trying to scale video delivery for global audiences are more video delivery architectures moving into the cloud because of that problem with scaling um, hardware, and then, you know, sort of, if you can, can you talk a little about, you know, maybe this is kind of a crazy question, but, you know, is there sort of an optimal mix between software and hardware, or, or should video distributors just, like, scrap all their physical infrastructure and put everything in the cloud? Can you kind of talk a little bit about those two things? Yeah, that's a nice, easy question. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> JT. I try. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. So, the... For the front end processing, the encoding, and things along that nature, I'm going to leave that up to the other experts here in the, this panel. And I believe for those that the typical cloud type thing, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts, is exactly where you want to do that as a scaling function. Uh, maybe you have some base resources within yours, but you scale to that. Our focus at Hellstorm is primarily on the edge. And at the edge, you don't have that, that luxury because the cloud is too centralized. And, but what you see is, and we, we use this expression a lot, is the cloud is a way of doing IT, not a place. And all of those techniques and software structures and things that have been optimized in the cloud for how they implement all those services are things you absolutely need to do at the edge. It's just that that cloud infrastructure is not there at this point. Uh, so what we see is it's not so much that people are moving to the cloud, but they're structuring their edge nodes to be a cloud, to use those same types of things. And what we're talking about are 
managed services, being able to quickly spin up a software process at the edge under a managed load that's AI-driven or machine-driven and have it dynamically adapt to your network needs. It's writing your software as small parallel services that run at, you know, in a serverless type node configuration so it just spins up wherever the need is. So you're not thinking about servers so much anymore. You're thinking about what the processes are. And as everyone here knows, software is not an asset. It's a debt. It's something that builds up every year that you have to constantly maintain. And one of the things that the cloud way of doing IT does is try to minimize that debt by making you more agile and flexible to changes. What we see is everyone who has these humongous, decades-old monolithic programs can't scale. They can't take advantage of highly parallel, multi-core processors. They can't take advantage of uh, changes in hardware acceleration with GPUs and FPGAs because they have to break their software to make those things work. However, if you engineer your, your system such that they take advantage of these small, highly parallel services with Kubernetes-type managed container environments, you can take advantage of those. And as hardware gets faster, as technology changes, you're a lot more flexible. So go back to your core question. Are people moving to the cloud for scaling purposes? Yes, on the front end and on the edge, they're changing the edge to be more like a cloud. And then as far as the correct mix of hardware and software, we kind of think everything should be software. So we look at hardware as being like software. It has to be flexible. It has to be dynamic. It has to change to the changing conditions in the market. So that's one of the reasons we focus on FPGA acceleration is it's something that can change. We build a function for a particular need. We get a 100x improvement on the front end of a CDN load at the edge. But if the environment changes, we can adapt to it. So to us, it's all software. It just happens to run in different types of specialty hardware. And we think that that's the way those highly performance scaling networks should be built out. Excellent. Now, I know I, I would assume that everyone else has an opinion about this. Um, you know, let's start with uh, with Guillaume. What are what are your thoughts on this, Guillaume? Yeah, there is a trend to virtualize everything, you know, including the CDN. Um, operating private uh, cloud infrastructure. Yeah, I, I suspect that when you when you talk about cloud, you mean public cloud, right? Uh, but, but the question is valid also for private cloud. So, yeah, I mean, operating private cloud uh, and possibly at the edge, by the way, uh, infrastructure makes the hardware a perfect scalable solution, right? So from a CDN operator or an ISP, the question is more about operating its own cloud infrastructure or public cloud infrastructure, or public cloud, sorry, uh, service. Operating a cloud as a service is very expensive and makes sense when launching a new service or for absorbing peaks, but not as a permanent solution, right? Uh, from the content provider perspective, uh, the question is more about, you know, CDN as a service versus ISP CDN operator network. Um, the later being probably the less expensive solution. Um, yeah, there is a, there may be a, a kind of mixed alternative where the, you know, the content provider can, can have its, um, it's uh, its own origin and, and part of the uh, delivery infrastructure, you know, this own origin uh, packager and, and then the, the rest of infrastructure, it could rely on uh, uh, virtualized, virtualized functions that could deploy in the, in this private infrastructure exposed by the, um, by the ISP or the network operator. I think this is really the future, right? This is really the future, like, like, like Brand said, you know, Everything, I mean, more and more delivery functions are going to be virtualized and deployed as network functions, you know, over a private cloud infrastructure. That's really what I, I, I believe, and I completely fully agree with that. That's really the, the future. So, JT, I, I have one comment to make because I think everybody's singing the cloud song, and I think. I would like to move the discussion maybe around the SaaS model. And what we saw until now was uh, SaaS offered basically service offered by CDN uh, public uh, companies. So they have their own network. 
Then we have companies like Broadpeak who are offering their own caching in the ISP. But I think they will probably coming up, hopefully very soon, new architecture where uh, a technology company would be able to offer the CDN as a service, putting the cache in the Opera's network. But in that case, the service should be managed by the vendor and not the operator. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Um, but still, we have not more than you yes, We see big CDN companies. We see technology companies providing boxes to operate by the operator, but we have not seen yet a SaaS model for CDN sitting in the ISP network. Well, so, and it's very interesting. So I'll, I'll, let me just add a little bit to that uh, from my perspective. So there are managed CDN offerings, um, you know, that exist within uh, the operator networks. Uh, most of the large CDNs have launched those or tried to launch them. Um, so there, there has been, you know, some experimentation. Uh, obviously, it's it would probably be more interesting if the operator network did it. So, you know, Comcast obviously... Uh, open source their CDN, but they have a business unit that runs a CDN uh, existing only within their network. Uh, I believe it peers uh, with other CDNs for off-net delivery. But again, I, I think that SaaS model does kind of exist for CDNs. It's not necessarily the model that people go to. Um, you know, I think they still use the service provider model uh, to help them manage, um, you know, everything there is for that. But yeah, but there is, has been some... Uh, some movement in that area, um, you know, around that model. Uh, Mark, Mark, any any comments on this topic? Well, I mean, uh, I would say that um, the move to the cloud that we are seeing has been very, very, I would say, I would say slow to take off in the video industry because of the, um, I mean, if you take live, it's uh, 24-7. So um, using the cloud can be challenging in terms of cost, and uh, that's what Guillaume said. Um, but I believe that um, it's only a matter of a um, month now um, where we will reach the point where it will be more uh, cost effective to use the cloud for doing the, at least the content uh, preparation, so the encoding, the packaging, and the origin, um, than doing it on-prem. I mean, what, I, what, what we see right now when we work with, with customers is that um, the cloud, I'm not talking about cloud uh, as a service, I'm talking about uh, YAS or PaaS systems where the customer is responsible for installing and maintaining a technology that is buys, that, 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 that it buys on the shelf. Um, we see that the, the cost of the cloud is now coming very, very close um, to the cost of um, on-prem slash private cloud infrastructure. So the future um, of live streaming is definitely in the cloud. And I mean, in terms of scaling, it's a, it's a no brainer. Yeah, I mean, I, I, wanna, I wanna piggyback a little bit on uh, you know, the point that Thierry brought up around sort of SaaS, right? This, there's, I guess, two models, right? So you can have the software, install it on the cloud and use the cloud to scale, or you can, employ a service provider who has that scale and is dealing with that scale um, on their own. So you're pretty much just using them as a service. And obviously those two models are very interesting, I think because they lead into this next question around uh, fragmentation, right? So the more pieces you have, to be honest, right, the more opportunity there is for things to break. Uh, but with that said, and, and, and obviously the integration and interoperability, you know, can be an issue too. But with that said, there is uh, an advantage to using quote unquote best of breed solutions for each component of the workflow. Um, and so I want to uh, turn to Guillaume a little bit, um, cause you know, obviously Guillaume, you're, you know, you guys are providing a service into, you know, for, for telecoms. Um, you know, is, is there a benefit or, or, you know, for a video distributor to go with a sort of all in one platform? Like, you know, Hey, Broadpeak offers all of it, right? They've got CDN and they've got my encoding and they've got all this extra stuff. And then I don't have to get all of these separate things. I can just go to Broadpeak. Or, you know, should a provider, should a video distributor sort of look at like what are the best of breed solutions? You know, I should employ those separately and connect them together, whether they're in the cloud or, you know, co-located in my data center. Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, that topic? 
Yeah, sure. Um, generally speaking, I would say DVRCT, I mean, in terms of uh, delivery function, is a good enabler for scalability. Working with one all in one solution may be appealing at first, but I think there are drawbacks linked with the locked in situation, you know, that can put the service at risk. And I don't think that such provider exist anyway. Yes, Broadpeak sell a lot of different components for building a CDN, but we really don't believe as, you know, uh, we don't at least bed and base our offer on, uh, you know, uh, this uh, kind of uh, all-in-one uh, solution. Yes, there are, the diversity is really good and there are so many uh, different places where you can, uh, you know, enhance the delivery that it's always good for a con from a content provider, let's say from a delivery infrastructure perspective to uh, to use the, like you say, the best of bread components and, and combine them. And I would say that this is, uh, it makes sense today because we have the, you know, the, the, the interfaces between all these components are more or less standardized today, you know, and much more than, than, than less, by the way. So from a content pro provider perspective, there is an advantage of, of for, let me give you some example of, of operating several CDN, for example, for avoiding the situation where one CDN may not be as scalable as expected, it can be congested, you know. So this is feasible through using a CDN direct, director, you know, like uh, many people, uh, many companies provide this kind of, of product and it is it has been proved very useful. Uh, we have a multipath, by multipath I mean, uh, from the client to the server, to the edge server, to the to the cache server, you can use multipath in order to operate not only one cache server but several cache servers concurrently. And uh, this has been proved also very useful. This is another piece that involves the the client, of course. And by the way. Um, Google with Quick has, has really understood the, the powerfulness of this and is, they are developing multipath inside the Quick stack. Um, you know, uh, in addition, operating their their own cache infrastructure, I mean, still, I'm still talking about content provider, uh, like a, a la Netflix, provides an over diversity opportunity, you know. Uh, so, so let's talk about Netflix a minute because Netflix is the opposite uh, example. Um, you know, Netflix was with its own technology and 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 attempt has attempted to master the entire chain, right? Player, origins, server, CDN. Well, it's not the complete chain, right? Because Netflix doesn't own the network, right? Doesn't own the last the land. The, the delivery network. So it's a, it owns a CDN, but not in, as an, it's not, a, it's not an operator, although it try to uh, penetrate the operator's uh, access network is, is not an operator, a network operator. Anyway, this model and a Netflix, where we try to master everything has been shown successful, but this is a question of business model, I think. Part of their uh, success is due to the fact that they were the first. Now the market is getting fragmented, right? So deploying conventional machine is going to be more difficult. And uh, that's why uh, virtualization is going to change the game because with virtualization and uh, also the, uh, considering the fact that standardization is, is good, you know, NFV, SDN, HTML5, TVP, blah, blah, blah. We have really the city, we have really the everything to um, to deploy the virtualization and to uh, to enable this uh, this best of breed components composing a delivery chain. Um, I would, uh, from a CDN operator perspective or a telco perspective, working with a unique provider, as I said, may drive to lock-in situation, right? Which is one. Uh, of the reason for adopting standardized solutions. But uh, again, um, uh, video delivery in, is one that is uh, hopefully uh, 
well standardized, I would say. We have a lot of standards, and including for virtualization. And this is this is really um, a really good enabler for this um, future, uh, let's say, uh, delivery chain based on uh, multiple uh, efficient components. Absolutely. Did anybody have anything else to add to that? I mean, obviously, it's, a, it's kind of a, you know, a, a tough question uh, to answer, you know, succinctly and to answer, um, you know, with, without, if I could without, you know, very, drop very, in very very quickly, JP. Uh, I, I don't want to belabor yeah. a point, but as an engineer, the, when I look at it, the more steps you have in the process, the more chances are that something's going to break. The more places you have to spend resources to maintain them and to optimize them. So the fragmentation to us definitely affects the idea of scaling. So trying to, if you're trying to get to the lowest total cost of ownership at scale, you've got to get fewer points, you know, fewer points of failure down. You've got to focus your efforts on what's important to you. You still have to have the, the cloud providers and the CDNs to, to handle overflow, but you've really got to focus on minimizing the number of steps between the encoding and the client. And if you can get that down to just one set, one best of breed, provider that, that does it for you, then I think that that's going to be your best chance for scaling to these large events. Yeah, I mean, using, uh, Guillaume speaking, eh? uh, using one, all-in-one provider or, or using best of breed components from multiple provider is different than saying that my delivery chain is, is very simple and composed with a few elements or my delivery chain is more complex and composed with a lot of elements. That's a different question from my perspective, for, from what I understood. But um, yeah, I agree. As uh, the, the delivery chain should be as simple as possible. And uh, I, I fully agree with that. We should avoid having a too complex chain. But um, on the other hand, um, my point was more about um, trying to optimize at the different, um, uh, regarding scalability again, and eh? trying to optimize at the different uh, uh, place and point in the chain, uh, operating different solutions that can pop up for solving particular problem is always good, and for scalability. Let me give you a small example. For example, um, uh, BBR, you have heard about BBR, right? BBR is the, it's a new congestion, control uh, feature that uh, that has been uh, you know deployed with the TC with tcp on the server side only and it's amazing it solved it's for scalability uh, uh, you know uh, for the scalability problem it's 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 it has uh, provided a kind of uh, between you know around 10 and 30 percent of of uh, enhancement regarding uh, uh, video delivery from one server perspective. So that's 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 amazing. It is just so. Let's let's say one provider can provide servers with BBR. You know, so then you can you can buy and you can deploy and implement this this solution because it's good for this particular uh, you know last mile TCP connection. That's one example, and you can. That's what I mean by uh, best of breed components. I'm not advocating for a more components. I'm advocating for best of breed components. That's, that's different. As I said, tough question to answer. <laughs> um, so we're, we're getting close here to the end of time. There's a couple of questions that I really want to get to. Um, and so uh, let's let's move on, and then we may have uh, some time for audience questions at the end. And if we don't, uh, that's all right. Uh, again, we can uh, you know carry on the conversation uh, via email and things like that. So um, this question is for Thierry, and I know this is really uh, really close to your heart. This <laughs> this next question, but um, you know, is there a relationship between scalability and quality of experience? Right. So I know. Obvious, the answer, obvious answer to that is, is yes, but what is that relationship, right? Is scalability increases? Does quality of experience just naturally get better? Um, and then how can video distributors ensure that they have or maintain the highest possible QOE while also providing that scalability, um, you know, to their operations? 
Yeah, so very good question. I would like to share first uh, some facts. Uh, during the World Cup, uh, we were able to measure uh, the traffic, number of users, and also the bit rate served by user. And you could see there was a, a clear relationship. The more users, the lower bit rate was served to the user, which means infrastructure has to be ready to support the lot of users. And this is not the case. So if you go back to this uh, content aware conversation, it's uh, quite a low hanging fruit where you can bring the bit rate down. And what we saw in our experiment, in our commercial deployment, is that when the bit rate is divided by two, you can easily, on very challenged network like mobile network, for example, reduce your buffering by two or three X. So if you have, let's say, 40%, you can go by, uh, let's say, 10% of buffering, which is a huge difference in terms of uh, consumer experience. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, companies like Netflix, YouTube have already done that at scale. And they have, uh, I think, uh, today, <clears throat> one of the best quality of experience. But in terms of the distribution network, and you saw Netflix with the open caching where they bring their own caching server into the ISP. This was mentioned, and I want to make it clear that with one or two servers, they can nearly stream the entire library. So this is not that much in terms of investment. Um, of course, smaller um, operators uh, cannot do that, and then you will have to negotiate. We discussed that with the uh, ISP. If you are not a big uh, uh, provider of, uh, of traffic, you might not be able to put your own cache. And I want also to mention that the quality of experience is not only related to the compression and the distribution, but you also have to do things on the client. And you probably have seen a lot of uh, literature recently on how a better decision can be done on the client. You have uh, people putting machine learning in the network in order to help the client take the better decision. You have a client optimization like a TCP acceleration that can bring a much better experience. And I believe this is one of the area where we see a lot of uh, literature from MIT and Stanford that will become, uh, hopefully, uh, through startups like uh, Cortex, becoming reality. So the client, I think we didn't discuss too much, but will help in the quality of experience because it's not only about the bit rate, it's not only about how good you can serve the stream, it's also how good you are going to consume it. Last but not the least, uh, you know that uh, Harmonic is putting a lot of effort in this network optimization, how to take the analytics from the client, from the CDN, from the network to make a better decision on your uh, infrastructure, especially in, the, in very, very peak events like uh, World Cup. We believe that the ABR mechanism doesn't work because it's, it's unregulated Every client can do good or bad things. Peer-to-peer, -peer, we discussed that. How can we improve the quality of experience using better caching at the client? Deep caching, open caching from streaming video alliance, I think has proven that this can also help. Multicast ABR, I'm going to pass uh, the token to my colleague uh, Guillaume, who is going to give you the, the merits of this uh, promising technology. Again, yes, can, you, so, can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah. yeah, I'll take it. I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, multicast IBR, this is really, a, you know, the uh, scalable uh, delivery uh, solution, if there is one. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it really is unsure the highest possible QE because it's not related to the number of, you know, sessions. Like Cherry said, I mean, more you have users, uh, more... Uh, <laughs> Your infrastructure, you know, is uh, is at risk, and and, and it, it impacts. It always impacts the the quality of experience, except if you if you operate and if you rely on the multicast or broadcast uh, uh, networking. And this is what multicast ABR is uh, is offering, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, I just want also to react on what what Shiri said about the the feedback on monitor monitoring. This is really key. I mean, because offering the best QE uh, at the bigger scale is always possible. I think, but the challenge is at what price. And and for that challenge, uh, we have to really understand what's the QE at the on the other side. I mean, on the client side. And and 
we really need a good feedback and monitoring solution. That's that. That and combine this with um, with the tools that we have, like 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 multicast ABR and and or multipath or local cache. You know, um, that thing. This is a uh, this is really uh, what we should do to to offer this best possible QE. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So we've got, we've got just a few minutes left. Um, so the last question that I want to get to is kind of a little forward looking question. Um, and what we'll do is if you can just, you know, spend like 30 seconds on an answer. So something really quick, but um, we'll start with Guillaume and, and end with Mark. Um, what is the single most important scalability challenge that video distributors should focus on in 2020? Um, you know, wh where should they put put their money, put their effort? Wh what's going to probably improve um, their video delivery most of all? Let's, uh, let's again, let's start out with Guillaume. Yeah. So in two, in twenty twenty, I think we will see uh, new OTT vault services, like you know, in France with Salto, many new uh, OTT vault services, and the widespread uh, deployment of live TV through OTT, I mean, not, you know, through OTT, you know, that uh, today life, life is on main screen, right? And the this is the most consuming use case, it's, and it's still over broadcast, but it's, it's migrating. And in 2020, I think we will start to see, you know, main screen involved in the OTT streaming uh, session. That's uh, when I say main screen, I mean of TV, of course. Huh? And it, it will multiply it will times the, the requirement, the bandwidth requirement by three, or between, between three and 10. So the, the, the network capacity will be at risk, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So we have to be, you know, we have to be inventive for in 2020. We have to be reactive. And uh, yeah, and low latency technology also we will, be, uh, will be spread, we'll start to spread next year. And more and more, as I said, on a big screen. On a big screen. In case of, um, and, and without multicast ABR, the challenge will be really to develop, implement the necessary feature for delivering that video with a minimum of latency and a maximum of QE. That, that's the challenge for next year. Interesting. Thierry, your thoughts? Uh, my thought, is I'm not going to advertise how efficient uh, compression should be. I'm more going to position the, the discussion on million plus simultaneous users for live services and that can scale. And I have this analogy about Netflix and say this is a great service and this is the benchmark and your service will have to be as reliable and as good in terms of quality of experience as Netflix. I keep getting this comment that we are not doing VOD, we are doing live, but for a consumer this is uh, not relevant because people are going to always benchmark the service with the Netflix service. So operators need to take Netflix as a benchmark. And we have written a, a good paper on the topic that we present at multiple conferences that basically explained there's a lot of work to be done. We touch on some of those during this webinar, but I think this is going to be the challenge. Don't beat only Netflix with the billions of dollars of investment but also on the quality of experience. Excellent. Brent, thoughts? Sorry, I had to get off mute. Really, Brent? Um, yeah, yeah, no, I'm back. Uh, so the biggest challenge that we see coming up is that in order to ta do what the previous speakers were just talking about, which is that OTT live video is going to become mainstream over the next several years, and right now it's at a fraction of, of hours watched, but it will become all of hours watched. There's simply not enough network bandwidth and enough equipment to do that unless you start putting the servers out at the edge. So you've, you've got to minimize the amount of network transport to the edge, and then the last mile between the edge and the, the client is the part that goes out actually over the, the public internet. And to do that, you've got to have the lowest cost of equipment to put out there, because it's going to be a lot more put out at the edge, and you've got to have as few steps between the encoding and that edge location as you can get, otherwise the costs become you know, too large to actually handle and you can't scale. Oh, very interesting. And then last, uh, Mark. Yeah, I would say that um, if you are a major content provider, major video uh, 
provider, you have to um, regain control on, on, on all the bricks that may be used to outsource. Um, I mean, everyone takes uh, for granted basically that uh, live streaming will work because VOD works, but it's not the case. I mean, it's very, very different in terms of, uh, of challenges. And I think uh, the key for launching successful services is to regain control on all the bricks of that streaming architecture. Fantastic. All right, guys, that was really great. Um, obviously, we had lots more questions to go through, and this is a topic that we could fill, you know, hours with, uh, you know, talking about. But you guys did fantastic. Really appreciate your expertise and, uh, you know, and contributing uh, discussion to a very important strategic point uh, for video distribution, which is obviously scaling video delivery. Um, I just want to thank all of our audience for hanging out with us for an hour and listening to the, uh, you know, to these guys talk and, and answer some really important questions. Hopefully, you got something from that. Again, this is recorded. We will be posting it on the website later today, and uh, we'll get that out uh, and start uh, socializing it as soon as we can. So, again, thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our attendees. And I hope everyone has a, a wonderful rest of their day. Take care, everybody. Thank you, JT. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.